Public affairs programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years. We talk one-on-one -on -one with Iowa's governor about abortion, tax cuts, education, and more gambling in the state. And not so fast how a county decision, a potential lawsuit, and two preservation groups could still salvage the old Rock Island County Courthouse in the cities. Rock Island County board members decided this week that the old Rock Island County Courthouse is historic. In some ways it is beautiful, but they did not yet decide if it'll stay or go. Once again, the final decision weeks away. Now the hint of a new lawsuit and a growing group of people who are making the most of the extra time. We'll have more on that in a moment. But first, Iowa's governor still going over legislation awaiting her signature from the 2018 session of the Iowa House and Senate. She's already signed some life changing bills into law. This week, Kim Reynolds was in the cities to talk about the condition of the state. But before she made that address, she sat down with us to talk about what's been accomplished and what still needs to be done. Well, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate that. Oh, it's, it's an honor. Thank you. You started this week in Dubuque to sign the uh, new opioid law. During your message, you pretty much said this is really important, but it's a first step. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a significant step forward, I think. And, you know, we have maybe an opportunity to get in front of it. We've seen the number of opioid deaths double in the last decade, but this is an opportunity for us to reverse that trend. And when I listen to governors on the eastern side of the coast or in Indiana or Kentucky, just some of the heart-wrenching stories and numbers of deaths that they're dealing with, uh, this is a significant step forward. So it helps identify doctor shopping. It helps reduce the number of pills prescribed. It has all of the providers using the prescription um, monitoring program, which is really essential. I think that'll go a long ways in helping us identify abuse uh, in the system. We're updating it also. So we had about 50% of the prescribers using it. Now we'll mandate all to use it, but we've made it a better system. So. Is that the key was to start in a way with the doctors and the pharmacists, those that dole out the pills? Well, both. I think, you know, it's a balance. So they have to treat the patients and do it. You know, they're the experts. But the, the chances of becoming addicted just exponentially increases after we're told five pills. And so, you know, that's not very many. And I think they're, you know, doing their, their prescribing fewer and fewer pills, but, you know, we want to do everything we can to encourage that. Those that wanted to see more action for you to go further, talk about the shared needle program, right. things like that. Is that something that you'd like to see addressed in future sessions? Well, you know, this is a first step, and we said that, and it should never be the last step. I have always said you should never be satisfied. We need to continue to look at the system, see how we're making pros progress, see where the gaps are at, and then come back and fill those. So I'm sure that that's something uh, that they'll continue to look at moving forward. I think the Senate uh, pretty much was behind that. There was maybe some issues in the House. And so most importantly, though, that that didn't stop the bill. We found compromise uh, in a bipartisan manner, and we were able to move forward and get something done and take a significant first step. And so we'll come back and review that moving forward. A heck of a session that is all closed. The other big issue, of course, as far as medical uh, issues are concerned, would be the uh, heartbeat bill, of course. Yeah, yeah. You seemed, when you signed that, I don't want to say hesitant, but you knew that it was going to be facing a challenge, which it now, of course, is. Yeah. Well, it was, I wasn't hesitant because, you know, it's not about the law, it's about life. And I'm a pro-life governor, and I said I would do everything in my power to protect a, a life. And so, um, you know, I just, I believe it's immoral to stop a beating heart. And this was a significant step forward. And we knew at the time that it would probably be challenged. We had the 20-week bill that was challenged. And so that's not unusual, but it's not about the law, it's about saving life. And so we'll go ahead and move forward with it. And uh, you have to do what you believe in and stay true to yourself, and that's what I did in signing the bill. Well, as you said, the 20-week bill was challenged. The yeah. six-week bill you knew it was going to be challenged. I mean, you basically have outlawed abortion in Iowa. Well, it's about life. Uh, I think, you know, it, it's, just, it's just simple, and I said it in my remarks, that if death is determined when a heart stops beating, then doesn't a beating heart indicate life? And I believe that all life is precious and sacred, and that we should do whatever we can to protect the unborn. And so, uh, 
you know, the lit it passed both chambers, both the House and the Senate, and Iowans elected those individuals to represent them at the Capitol. And I have made it very clear that I am pro-life and would do everything in my power to protect the unborn. And, and that's what we're doing. Do you see this as a perfect example of a challenge against Roe v. Wade? You know, I think it's about protecting life. Again, I but think. But would you like to see it on the well, national stage well, that Iowa know, led? It, it will. Well, it, we're doing. We're, we're leading the country when it comes to life, and I think we should be proud of that. Let me ask you also about the other big bill, of course, and that would be tax reform throughout yeah. the state of Iowa. Um, once again, is this a first step, or, or are you happy with the way the bill turned out? Well, I said even in the condition of the step, in my condition of the state, that it would be a two-step process. But we were focused on, especially with the historic federal tax reform that was passed in December. It really focused on uh, hardworking middle-class families and small businesses and farmers, and we wanted to make sure that we passed those same savings on. We were in a unique situation because we're only one of three states that have federal deductibility. And what that means is when your federal taxes go down, if we didn't implement tax reform at the state level, Iowans were going to see their taxes go up. And we did not want to see taxes increased on, you know, middle class families or, or small businesses or farmers. And so it was an opportunity for us to really focus on those individuals and focus on workers. And then I said, over the interim, what we'll do is bring a bipartisan group together. We'll take a look at all of the tax credits that are in place and do the due diligence, see which ones are working what the return of investment are for those tax credits, uh, maybe eliminate some, and then start to address uh, corporate tax reform as well. So that would be the second phase that we'll take a look at moving forward. Less money in the coffers for Iowa though, right? Well, we did it in a sustainable manner, and I think that's what Iowans need to know. First of all, it's their money, and you know, if you didn't do anything, your taxes were going to go up. And that's not what we were interested in doing, but we wanted to do it in a fiscally responsible and sustainable manner, and that's what we've done. We phased it in. We paid back uh, the money that we borrowed from the cash reserves. We have over $748 million in our savings accounts, so that's sitting there. We have significant balances, and we did it in a manner that we can still um, maintain our priorities, which is education, uh, health care, and public safety. When you, so, say, when you say education first, though, yeah. a lot of the uh, uh, university system in Iowa believes that it's being short shrift by the legislature, yeah. and this budget does not help in any way. And, and, and when it comes to whether you call it cuts or smaller increases, it yeah. seems like the university system really is taking it on the chin. Well, let's talk about K-12 education, because that's our future and our greatest asset. And our universities have other alter, uh, options when it comes to funding. Uh, we have stayed true to our priority in K-12 education, and we've made it a priority uh, over the past several years. In fact, since 2011, we've put $765 million of new money into the K-12 system. Uh, there was a study that was done and there's only three other states in the country that have invested at a higher rate in K-12 education than Iowa. We're number four in the investment in K-12 education over the past 10 years. We were number eighth in teacher salaries across the country. Um, and in addition to that, we have a national, nationally recognized um, STEM, science, technology, engineering, uh, and math program that is really helping our young people be prepared for a knowledge and global economy by helping them with hands-on um, experiences, work-based learning, and really matching them up with employers that are in their communities. Which is all good and well, of course, and I don't want to well, dismiss that. it's really that. important. Exactly. I don't think we should ever. People want to say that we're cutting, and that's not true. We right. are putting new money into K-12 education, and that is our future. But as you know, Davenport has its uh, financial woes. It's, it's dipped into reserve funds yeah. in order not to make cuts. But the uh, school superintendent is under investigation by the uh, state education department. So some districts are hurting. Well, you know, there are laws on the books, and we have to operate within the existing laws. That's why we have a legislature. That's why we have a process. But we also addressed that this year. So not only did we put new money into K-12 education, but we provided all kinds of flexibility for school districts across the state. We increased funding for transportation and for per-pupil per spending, which addresses the Davenport um, issue. We continued. We made $35 million available by providing flexibility that they wouldn't have had access to this year. So we've continued to look for opportunities to give all of our school districts more flexibility to really utilize the revenue that they have uh, in, a, in a manner that, they, that, that works with each of the varying districts. So we've done a lot to continue to work with 
our school districts across the state. I'm proud we held them harmless when we had to do the DIA probe. We've done that for two years. Uh, there was only three entities that we held harmless, and that was K-12 education, Medicaid, and the backfill. And uh, when everybody else had to step up and do their part, you know, and to, to make the budget balanced. And so I'm proud of what we've done for K-12 education. And we're going to continue to invest in our young people. Future Ready Iowa is a great initiative. It passed bipartisan support, unanimous bipartisan support. Critics, though, say that it may not be well funded. Oh, it will be well funded. That's what they always say when they, they you know, they voted for it. So, you know, unanimously in, in the House and the Senate because they know it's the right thing to do. That's the biggest barrier that we have to economic development in this in this state. And most importantly, this is about providing opportunities for all Iowans to get the skills that they need to fill the jobs that are open right now. If you go to the workforce uh, uh, website, we've got an app that tells the number of jobs that are available in the state on a daily basis, and that ranges anywhere from 65,000 to 70,000 jobs available on a daily basis. And what that says to me is this is opportunities for Iowans, and we want to help them get the skills and match them up with a great employer and do that. Here U.S. In Supreme Iowa. Court making a decision this week, of yes. course, in regards to sports gambling. Yep. Very exciting, at least for the gambling industry in Iowa, legislation expected to be introduced in January of the next session. Yeah, I think we'll work with the legislators over the interim and see, you know, take a look at what that looks like. I know there was some legislation that was introduced this year. It just didn't get past both chambers in the in the same format. So I'm, they'll be looking at it over the interim and probably address that next year. I want to talk politics in our last few moments. You are the first female governor of Iowa. Would being elected by the people mean so much more to you? Oh, well, first of all, it's just an honor to serve. I love this state. I'm a fifth generation Iowan. Uh, I grew up in a small rural town, uh, St. Charles, Iowa, population of about 500 people. My dad worked at John Deere for 40 years farm. My mom was a stay at home mom. And, you know, the fact that I had the opportunity to run and serve as a county treasurer, to serve in the state Senate, to be elected the lieutenant governor, and now to serve at the Iowans at the highest level as governor of this amazing state um, is really just. Um, um, I think it's 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 it just speaks to the opportunities that exist in Iowa, where if you work hard and you have a passion for what you do, uh, anything is possible. So we're going to continue. We've got a great story to tell. We're the number one state in the country, for heaven's sakes, according to U.S. News and World Report. We were sixth, and we went to number one, and that's based on uh, education and health care and infrastructure, opportunity, quality of life. I mean, there are so many positive things happening, but there's so much capacity for even additional great things to happen. And so I'm looking forward to traveling across the state and continuing to talk to Iowans, but most importantly, to continue to listen to Iowans because that's really how we put our program together too. You know, we lay out a vision, but we listen to what's working and what's not working, and then that's how we kind of address how we continue to move forward to keep building a better Iowa. Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds. Still ahead, it's not over until it's over. The new ways some are fighting to save the old Rock Island County Courthouse. But first, finding things to do in these last few weeks before Memorial Day. And for some, the start of summer break. Laura Adams joins us. She's out and about. This is Out and About from May 14th through 20th. Hi, I'm Laura Adams. On May 19th, the TBM Avengers appear at the Illinois Valley Regional Airport in Peru, Illinois. Historic aircraft flights and helicopter rides are available, plus famous warbirds from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. The 2018 Prairie Queen Quilt Club Show takes place May 18th through 20th at the Old Colony School Building in historic Bishop Hill. Or join the Picnic for Prospect, including a hog roast and all the fixins'. There will also be live music and more, benefiting Prospect Park Pavilion. Registration required. Underneath the towering oak trees, sip your way through a spectacular assortment of 180 wines from around the world at St. Ambrose's annual Wine Festival and Tasting. Circa 21 hosts the Bobby Darin Tribute May 16th with two shows, and the following day enjoy two performances of Man in Black, the music of Johnny Cash. Riverbend Bronze present Classical Bells on May 20th, a concert featuring classics from different genres. Celebrate the legacy of Dick and Mary Jo Stanley at the Follow the Music concert in Weed Park in Muscatine on May 20th. The Bucktown Reviews season finale takes place the 18th at the Nice Wander Junior Theater, while Playcrafters Barn Theater present Bingo! The Winning Musical, sure to be a zany delight, May 11th through 20th. For more information, visit wqpt.org. 
Thank you, Laura. Lojo Russo says her music style is varied and unexpected. Many of her influences came from the years she was living in the Twin Cities. But for years, she's been performing here in the Quad Cities, including a recording session at Moline's Black Box Theater. That's where we now feature Lojo Russo and Street Sing. That's Lojo Russo with Street Sing. Preserving the past can sometimes be messy, and that's certainly the case with the Rock Island County Courthouse. The construction of a new courthouse annex was pushed along by the legal threat from the district's top judge. Plans to demolish the old courthouse then were introduced by that same judge at the end of last year. Now this week, groups hoping to save the old courthouse are also perhaps turning to the law with the hint of a suit that could stop demolition. Joining us is Diane Moore with the Moline Preservation Society. How are you doing, Diane? I'm fine. Thank you for having me. Well, let's start with the vote by the Rock Island County Board, basically saying now that until mid-July is when they'll make a definite decision on the future, the fate of the Rock Island County Courthouse. Do you see that as wiggle room? 
Well, it gives two months to try to come up with and work with them, and hopefully we could work with them to try to point out some issues and some possibilities of some things to do to try to save it. Uh, but two months is a is not a very long period of time. But we're talking about, how do I say this, more than just bricks and mortar. It's more than the building. You're going it from the angle that, yes, we want to keep the building, but we don't agree where we're getting the funding as far as the demolition is concerned, that, making the whole thing moot. That's right. That's, that's correct. I think I look at it as two issues. As a preservationist, I'm looking at the preservation angle of it, but also as a citizen of the county, I am looking at it, is it legal to do this? And that's why we went with the uh, attorney to give us a second of, of opinion. The county board had gotten their opinion and uh, their attorneys that they hired out of Chicago were the same ones that got them the bond money. Uh, they're more like financial lawyers. Uh, we went with uh, a, a firm that is involved in construction um, agreements and understanding all of this and basically it's the citizens of Rock Island who should talk about tearing down the courthouse. And I might point out that the, a, the annex that's being built is an annex to the jail. Mm -hmm. It's not to the courthouse. This is an annex to the jail. And they have put in two holding cells which tie it into the annex to the jail. Um, it's, and it has some courtrooms in it, but so did the the jail have courtrooms in it also. And I should explain the whole idea of building this annex they bonded for it. It was a special committee that does that. And they had cost savings. And that's where they want to use that money as far as the demolition for the old courthouse. And that's where the fight is, is whether or not that money should be allowed. And, and that money, they, they bonded for more than what they anticipated they needed in case an emergency came up. Right. And I understand that completely. If you're building a house, you want to have a little extra funds because you never know what's going to happen. But once that money is sitting there, then it legally, in my opinion, and that of the attorneys that we hired, should go back and lower the cost of the bond, therefore saving the taxpayers, me and you and anybody who else who lives in Rock Island County, saving us interest money that we have to pay on the bond. This is not free money to be played with. This is money that was set aside for one purpose and that was for this annex. Well, I've got this letter from your attorney, the, the Quinn Johnston Group, and, and it doesn't say we're going to sue. It just kind of gives that hint that, hey, county, if you do that, you open yourself to the possibility of a lawsuit. Am I interpreting that right, or do that you is, really plan on filing that's, a lawsuit? That is correct. The two organizations, because this came in yesterday, have not had a chance to actually get together yet. Mm -hmm. So two I organizations had, being the Rock Island Preservation Society and the Moline Preservation right, Society. Right, the two preservation societies right. are going to be meeting together, their boards, and deciding what our next step will be. So, you know, we're trying to work with them, but at the other end of the, I guess, the spectrum is the possibility of an injection. Mm -hmm. Real possibility? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> is this an expensive proposition as far it as the preservation yes. societies it, are concerned? It, it, it can be expensive, and that's another thing that we have to sit and talk about is mm -hmm. the funds and how do we raise the funds that's to what do I was that. Going to ask, yeah. But I think that um, if nothing else, I think that the citizens need to be aware that there is some things that are going on that might not be quite kosher and that it's not being legal and that, you know, they need to question this. And our attorney feels that if the courthouse is to be dem demolished, it should be by vote of those who live in Rock Island County. And uh, that's not the way it's set up right now. But that's not the way construction projects usually are. I mean, when, when they built a new Rock Island Police Department, they didn't vote to demolish the buildings there. I mean, are you asking for a little too much? Do you really think that there'd be a, a referendum on, on, not that there shouldn't be, but do you really think that <laughs> would happen? That's what we feel that should happen. Mm -hmm. Yes, we feel it should happen, that that's a decision that needs to be made by the voters. Um, and that's, you know, it says in the agreement that uh, that money cannot be spent for anything else except for what it was set aside for. And if you want to use it for something else, then I think you need to ask the voters. That money is there to be set aside and go back to, to lower that bond. As you and I think we're talking more than just $1.5 million. Because which is I the estimated cost for the demolition. That's the cost of the demolition, but they also want to use some of that money to remodel um, the office 
um, annex. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there has to be more than 1.5. I'm not sure exactly how much money is left over. Let's talk about the two months that you said. I mean, till mid-July, July, July yes. 18th, I believe, is the target date for the Rock Island County Board to actually finally make a decision. Um, what, what, what's the timeline for you guys then? I mean, the clock is ticking, as you said. Yes, it seems that preservationists always have a deadline, and it's a very short deadline, and we have to be working all the time. Um, but we want to look at some other options, and I think one of them is doing a, uh, the gentleman last night even talked about mothballing the building for a period of time, using maybe only the first floor, and then as uh, time and money is allowed to go to the second floor. Uh, we're very hopeful that the budget, when it's passed from the state of Illinois, will include include a um, tax credit for historic preservation. Uh, Illinois is a state that does not have it, but our border states do. Um, you know, look at what's happening in Davenport. Uh, I know that the groups over there would very much like to come over and do some work here, but to put a big project together, they need tax credits, not only on the federal level, but on the state level. And we in Illinois do have it for some cities. Mm -hmm. Peoria has it. Rockford is allowed to have it. The states, I think, picked out five cities that they experimented with very successful in those five cities. Uh, Representative Halperin is trying to put through to extend it to other cities and if that were to go through that would make the courthouse much more attractive for somebody to come in and redo it and then rent out the space and in some cases rent it out to the county so that they could have a county camp campus there. I want to get real quickly to one more perhaps wrinkle that you're investigating and that is that uh, it is not the county courthouse is not registered as a national historic structure. That's correct. But. But it is eligible to be. And why is that important for your argument, the fact that it is eligible for it? Because a structure that is eligible and it gets demolished, nothing can be used, that's, let me rephrase that. No federal tax money can be used to put anything in its place or to um, tear it down. Mm -hmm. So you can't use federal funds to tear it down and you can't put, use federal funds to put something in its place. And that is going to be yet another piece of your, well, if I'm going to say litigation or piece of your argument when it comes uh, forward for the next two months. So we'll right. be keeping an eye on this for the next two months. Yes, Diane Moore. well, thank you very much. It should be an interesting two months. That may be an understatement. It's already been an interesting six to eight months when right. we first started talking about this. Diane Moore, Moline Preservation, thank you so thank much. Thank you so very us. much for having me. WQPT is doing its part to support the military men and women in the cities who are serving our nation. We call it embracing the military and military fathers can take to the ice with their kids for free later this month. Rock Island Arsenal Family Advocacy Program and Families First will host a military dad ice skating event next Thursday at the River's Edge in Davenport. It includes free skating, a hamburger or hot dog basket and more. Contact the U.S. Army's MWR office for more information on the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Public affairs programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years.